today I have with me podcaster and author Mer Lafferty and I am talking to her because she wrote this new book called Six Wakes and hi Mer thank you so much for coming on my show. Thanks it's, it's great, great to be here. here. I I am not a science fiction person I have to say but you this book was so good I think that I might now be I think oh yay! <laughs> I think you've changed my mind. I mean, I and you know what's awesome is that I don't know if you've ever heard of Roz Morris, but she is also she's like an indie author. But she was right. She wrote a science fiction book that I read, and I was like, how? I mean, maybe you get this all the time, but like women writing science fiction. This is a, this seems like a new thing to me. Nope, not no. at all. No. No, no. There are a lot of women writing science fiction and have been for a while. It's just uh, who gets the attention, who gets the reviews, that kind of thing. But uh, if you check out the latest uh, award ballots for the past, say, five years or so, there are a lot more women on it just because we're finally getting the attention. But we've been here for quite some time. So Yeah, she said that's what happens to her is people are like, you, right? you don't look like a science fiction writer, you know, but she's English. She's from England. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. but anyway, I went, so, you know, that was what attracted me to it too, because I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to read a woman writing science fiction. And, you know, it's not like you can tell. I mean, it's exactly like every other science fiction, but it is, it was so good. You had me, you had me <laughs> till the end, which I guess is the point, but, um, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to talk about like, I love talking to authors about names, okay, and like the names of the characters and how you come up with them because that's always like the hardest point for me. So do you, when you're starting out to write a book, is that where you start? Um, no, no. Names are very difficult for me. Um, I, I have a lot of trouble coming up with names. Names will change frequently in a book for me, not frequently, but, um, I almost never have an idea for a name that's, that's proper and, and works to start out with. So, um, my reasoning behind names usually has to do with looking up baby names yes. on websites. It's nothing more fancy than that. Unfortunately, I wish I had a, a knack for names cause I love it when people do. But uh, that's not really one of my skills, unfortunately. Including that's including book titles, names of people, all that stuff. Well, you've certainly written enough books, so I mean, I think that <laughs> I think you do a very good job with that. But thank you. I I do that too. Like you know, I've always written like little stories, and I've always nothing published. But you know, I've but I always go to the baby names. I do the mm -hmm. same thing because I look up a meaning that I want it to mean and then it kind of cross-reference, you know, meaning and then name. So, okay, so Maria, how did that name come to you? I don't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, knew, okay. I knew I wanted a, a Hispanic woman uh -huh. and uh, that, that name just came. I don't, I don't remember why. But that's, you know, it's a popular Hispanic woman's name, so mm -hmm. especially, you know, at that time. But, yeah, I, be, I think your names really fit. I didn't need you to describe the characters. Your names fit who they were. So it's not like you had to say, oh, and this guy is, you know, Japanese. And this guy, it, like, their names fit who mm -hmm. they were. So you, And that's really awesome because then you don't have to go into that much of a description of, you know, who they are. So, right. You know. But let's let's start let's start at the beginning of you. Like, how did you get into writing? Um, I wanted to write for as long as I could remember. Um, I was a voracious reader as a kid, and then when I had a chance to, when I started writing uh, reading science fiction and fantasy uh, by women with female heroes, uh, that's when I thought that's what I want to do. So it was works by Anne McCaffrey and Madeline LaIngle that really uh, spurred me on to, to become a writer. Mm. So early, early in childhood uh, did I was I writing and then wanted to keep doing it, uh, really wanted to get into it once I started into science fiction and fantasy later on. Right. So did you go, did you have a degree in writing? Did you go to college? 
Uh, I went to college and got a degree in English. I thought I wanted to do journalism, but I don't really have the grit for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I got an English degree, and then I recently went and got my MFA in popular fiction, but that was, you know, a couple of years ago. So I had several years of messing around with words and stuff before I decided to get some uh, my master's degree. Did that? Did you think that helped? Like, is do you suggest that for writers? I do. It's not necessary, right. but um, I think it helped me. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard to when it comes to things like art. It's hard to say right where exactly you improved. Mm-hmm. But I know I'm a better writer now than I was before I went in, mm-hmm. and um, it was it was a really good workshop experience because I I was in. 10 day workshops at a time with my peers and my instructors and got a lot out of it. Wow. That's great though. That's great. I mean, I've heard a lot of people, I have authors who have, you know, gone to get their MFA and don't regret it, you know, for the most part, you always get something out of it. But, um, what I, what I like about science fiction that, that I'm finding out, which is interesting, I've been a reader my entire life, a very heavy reader, you know, and Mm -hmm. I never went there of course, and I'm older than you, and you know, for for my time, it was like Star Wars, Star Trek, and you know, I always just associated that with not of my. I always wanted romance books and you know, mm-hmm. drama. But what I love about science fiction now is that I'm understanding as the reader and the writer and talking to writers is is it's open territory. You can just make it. I mean, it is your world to mm-hmm. make, and that is what's awesome about it. You know, yeah. with your imagination, you can come up with your own world. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the exciting parts about it. Yeah. Um, most science fiction tends to reflect things that we're going through, and it you know so it often reflects social things going on in the world at the time of the author's life. Um, but still, you can expand that theme and tell whatever story you want wherever you want. Mm-hmm. A anywhere. lot of freedom. It's really cool. Yeah. And so this book takes place in the 25th century. So, you know, it's years from now. And and cloning is now a thing. Like, and it, and I love that because, you know, we're we're coming up into science where clothing, cloning is becoming something. And, and we don't know. We don't know what's mm-hmm. going to happen with it. But I love that you explore the trouble that we can get into. Like, as, as amazing as it is seems like it could be you know the trouble that you get into when you decide to clone human beings yeah it's a big it's a big ethical thing and another piece of the technology in the book which we can't do as far as i know is um you take a uh when you copy the genome you also take a copy of the person's mind map which is all their memories and their uh mental makeup so you, when they get recloned, they can be exactly who they were when you recorded it. So, um, and once you can record that, the next step would obviously be hacking that. And you can hack it for better, such as to fix a genetic problem, or hack it for worse, such as, you know, if more cosmetic things. And if it's your own choice, it's one thing, but uh, in the book, parents start quote unquote, fixing their babies. And that gets a lot of people very angry. And so that kind of hacking becomes illegal because of those people who are unscrupulously hacking uh, children. (laughs) Right. And uh, I just basically tried to go through and try to figure out if cloning became widespread and not super prohibitively Difficult, <laughs> very expensive, where it's hard to speak. That's why I'm a writer. Yeah. Um, uh, it, not terribly expensive. I tried to think of, well, what, what problems would come up? I mean, there would be issues with estate laws. Um, you know, if you, if you keep cloning yourself, then if you ever had children, they wouldn't be able to inherit from you, and that might make them angry. And so I, I just tried to figure out all the things that would go wrong and what they could, um, the laws they would pass. And then, of course, once laws are passed condemning something, people who like to do that thing are going to be pissed off. So it's it's uh, that kind of got the whole political aspect of it rolling. 
Yeah, I, I thought it was, I was actually talking to my son who's 17 about it because I said, imagine a world where, you know, you're, you give birth to a child that, you know, has some kind of defect or something that you don't like and then you just like, oh, I can fix this. I can make almost the perfect, you know, you can make almost the perfect clone, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, but then, you know, the, the part I loved was that as they're cloning, they're only remembering so much. I mean, that's what made the book fascinating was like what they could remember and what they couldn't remember. And, and I loved how you went back and forth and explored each character, you know, to, as a reader, it was a really, it was such a, a fun read for me you know, to mm -hmm. go, to keep going back and forth. And it's like, oh, this is what happened to this person. And, and so then I was like, and maybe you can explain this to me because I was trying to think of for six weeks, is it, explain to me that title. Like I was trying, I was like, what am I, what am I thinking about, about the, how many wake ups they have or that there were six, I don't know, explain it to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's the, the, uh, the title was based on the original thought I had for the novel which then evolved as I wrote the novel and worked with an editor, but the marketing department really liked the title, mm. so we kept the title. Nice. Initially, there were going to be uh, several wakes thrown on the ship for the living inhabitants. So six people, six wakes, as right. in the ritual uh, uh, death party thing. Right. And when... We're keeping the title, but removing some of the actu actual wakes. I realized I had to expand what wake meant and think waking up, things like that. So uh, right. this is this is where uh, mark sales and marketing had their hand in it. So I had to figure out how that still fit. Yeah, and it, that's the thing. It's like it does keep you thinking throughout the whole thing. I was trying mm -hmm. to tie it in. And I personally like shorter titles, you know, some books have longer titles, but I always think it, it's a, if you can think of it in a word or two, if you can catch me, you know, yeah. so that's why I like the title because I was like, oh, good. okay, so that's, inter you. you know, that's an interesting thing. And it kept me thinking, even if I was wrong, if I came up with my own as to what it meant, it doesn't matter as a reader, mm -hmm. you, you can have your own idea sure, you know, exactly. of exactly what it meant. So what number, I know this is, is this the first science fiction thriller that you've written first of all let's look at this look at how cool that is science, science fiction, fiction thriller i guess so oh, um i wrote a science fiction novella um this is just a beautiful cover thank you well i can't take credit for it that was a little bit but uh yeah, thank you for all my artwork that i was staying up all night doing <laughs> <laughs> um the uh but i'm sorry i lost my train of thought okay First science fiction. Thriller. Yes, yes, yes. My, my, I wrote a science fiction novella about um, aliens bringing back the patronage system on the moon. Um, also, gladiatorial fights to the death came back as well um, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But And that's like the only other hard sci-fi I've, I've written. I've written some short stories, and uh, but most of my work tends to skew towards contemporary fantasy. But um, I like I like science fiction and um, really liked writing this one. So I'm probably going to keep with it. The real challenge for this actually was the mystery aspect of it because I hadn't read a lot of mysteries. Mm. So I mainlined a lot of Agatha Christie before I uh, wrote the – before I worked on the, the bulk of the book so I could get a sense of how she puts uh, murder mysteries together. Interesting because you definitely – you definitely did. You know, I read a lot of thrillers and you definitely had me going, I have mm -hmm. to say. And like I said, I really love the going back and forth because then you're trying to find clue. You're like, okay, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure this out. And of course, you know, we won't talk about the ending. But let's just say I read this in a day. Oh, wow. Excellent. Excellent. I read this. I mean, I can do a, a book a day on a, on a good day, but I, 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 with thrillers, it's like, I have to finish the book that day. Mm -hmm. I'm not good at putting a book down. And so I just carry it with me and I read it and I read, <laughs> I read the entire book. So, um, it's, it does say a lot for it when I can't put a book down. So excellent. Yes. So let me talk about your podcasting world because you are the first podcaster I've ever talked to besides okay. my son. I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry, Kyle, cause he's editing this. 
he does have a podcast. I shouldn't say that. Mm-hmm. You're the first female podcast I've ever talked to. Okay. <laughs> but no, he has, a, he has a podcast about, um, uh, he he's into sports and nutrition and fitness and that kind of stuff. But you have a, you have a podcast called I Should Be Writing. Yes, and, and one called Ditch Diggers. Diggers and Ditch Diggers, and they're both very popular, I hear. And yeah, kind of. They've been around for a while. At least I Should Be Writing has. Yeah, I should be writing. So explain to me, like, what you talk about in that. Like, are do you have guests? Do you have, you know... Sometimes. You? Uh, I, ha- I should be writing came about, um, I believe... No one's ever corrected me on this, but I believe it was the second writing podcast that ever existed. Um, the first one was uh, Michael A. Stack Pulls the Secrets, where he was... He's an established uh, fantasy and science fiction writer, and he had a newsletter... And he would just repurpose his newsletter into audio and release it via podcast. And I thought that I loved that podcast. It was great. But I thought, you know, no one's talking to beginner writers from the point of view of someone who still understands what they're going through. You know, like he would give great, great advice on character and theme, but not so much. Okay, so you've been rejected. You feel like dirt. Mm -hmm. How do you move on? Mm -hmm. Um do you really think the editor put your name on a blacklist that's on the wall right now? I mean, all of the anxiety and weird things that beginning writers deal with, that's what I try to talk about in I Should Be Writing. And it's been going on for almost 12 years now, but uh, the um, the basics still need to be covered. And... Um, The secret is what I do is I just talk about my own anxieties and just try to tell anybody that if you have these anxieties, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. And this is how I get past it. So it might help you. Um, And so I've I've had a lot of fun with it. I've learned a lot and I've talked to almost all of my favorite living writers. So uh, as as just as interviews, Mm -hmm. um, which was a big thrill. You know, I just keep thinking back to when I was a child and my biggest thrill was getting a letter back from one of my favorite writers. And now I'm able to, like, call them up. I always thought it was so weird. People had movie stars. I had writers, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, it was just, I just had a sense of uh, how awesome it is now that I get to interview my favorite writers. So it's, uh, it's. It's been a, it's it's really made my career because what one thing I didn't know that I was doing at the time was networking. So right. you know these people would remember me because I interviewed them, right. and so I could say hi to them at conventions later on. And I, I tell my listeners that networking is just like a drop in a bucket. It doesn't feel like saying hi to someone and having them remember you is going to tip the scales either way, but one drop might actually make something overflow and something happen. So I just, uh, and I think that that doing my show did help me meet people and become more comfortable around writers and at conventions. And then, um, certainly didn't hurt my career. Right. And, and that's what I always think about with this. It's like, I thought, who do I want to talk to? Well, who are my favorite people? Well, writers are my favorite people. Mm-hmm. You know, so and and Oprah when she started her book club, it was I it was during a time I'm a lot older than you, but it's during the time that um, I was having my children, and she had this one book a month, and I was like, I need a book a day club. Like, I, yeah. I need a, a book a month was totally ridiculous to me. I would go buy the book, read the book, and wait 29 days for her mm-hmm. to have the author on, you know? And yeah. so when I started this, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to read books, and then I want to talk to the authors about their books and ask them the questions that I want to ask. And mm-hmm. that I think everybody who reads, who readers are out there. And it's almost like she gave readers a voice, and I'm really appreciative of that because I don't know that we had that before her. That you right, know, I think, and she and I read something that she got told not to do it. Everybody was against it. That she really had to fight the network at the time to have that in her mm-hmm. show. And so I'm really appreciative because I think it did open it up that authors became people that we saw on TV and that they were, you know, they weren't just behind a book, you know, like they were at that, at that time. 
So oh, I, I didn't, didn't know that. that. That's, That's really cool, cool of her. Yeah, I know she's. Yeah. I mean, she's almost, she's almost everything she's done in her entire life has been amazing. So uh, yeah, I don't know why that surprises just... me, but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's no, nobody wants to see writers. We 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 hide behind our closed doors and pound on our keyboards. Right, and she gave and look what she did for authors. I mean, mm-hmm. that's another thing to be so appreciative. She didn't. I, I actually talked to a woman who wrote a book about what Oprah did to for authors. Mm-hmm. Because she worked at a bookstore back in the 80s and 90s. And she said that, that, that you know, remember when Oprah, you, you might not remember this, but she would have a I big really am a lot older than you think I am. I promise. <laughs> well, she would have a big reveal. Like it would be mm-hmm. like on a Friday and it was like, and the next book is this one. And everybody would like cheer. And the next day, the woman that, that I talked to from the bookstore, who is an author also, but she said all of a sudden, like that day, they became famous people. Like here yep. they were just back there writing their book and then Oprah made them the next day, not only did their book shoot to number one mm-hmm. the next day and they couldn't keep enough. I, I hope she gave them notice after time to keep the book in print, yeah. you know, I don't know how big Kindle was back then, but you know, like it was, it did enormous, it did big, huge things for authors and what she was be able to, you know, she ch- turned their life around and I, that's. I was always thinking about that in the back of my mind. It's like, I want to be able to talk to authors and put their faces on when I can. And, you know, and then you do the same thing because you have them on your podcast and, Mm -hmm. and you get to ask them your questions and pick their brain for all their, you know, knowledge that I'm sure is very fun to hear. Oh yeah. It's, it's awesome to listen to different stories that, that authors have. So it's been a real pleasure. And every time I think I need to, I've said everything I need to say. Someone writes me and either they've just discovered my show or been very moved by my show and, and say that, that just give me the, the encouragement to keep going. Yes. So that's, that's always really helpful. Yeah. And you, you've kind of made up a term that I never heard of (laughs) when I was looking patio books. Oh, I didn't make that up. No, oh, audio no. book. Uh, those are created by some friends of mine back when we were serializing fiction back in '05 or so. So, patiobooks.com is where we uh, serialize them. I don't know if they're still doing stuff right now, but that's what we were doing. You could subscribe to something and get a, a different chapter every week for people who were serializing their books via podcast. Nice. I never heard of it. You know, so mm-hmm. I thought it was like a term that you so. So some of your books, that's what you did, that you went on a podcast and then gave a chapter or two, just like an audio book, but you paid for it? No, I I self-published via podcast, so I would release one chapter a week or so, and these guys would uh, collect it and let people subscribe to it as their own podcast with their own um, delivery schedule. Like, I could, you, you could subscribe right now to a book I wrote in 2007 and get a chapter every week. Again, I'm not sure if they're still up and running, but, um, that was, that was what we were doing back then. Oh, okay. So I was thinking that you were like reading your books on a podcast, almost like an audio book, but on a podcast. I thought I did do that, but audio books was like a central hub that you could get almost anybody who was doing, uh, doing that back then. You could really sit on your own feed. Okay. Excuse me. And then they would create feeds for people who wanted to just get that um, that story. Oh, okay. So uh, did you do the audio book for this book? Yes. You do do that. I figured. Well, I, I narrated. They, yeah, the, you narrated. The publisher took care of all the production. Right, but you got to narrate it. I, which yeah. I also love is when authors narrate their own audio books. Yeah. Different, I, I sense a feel about it. Not that there aren't good narrators out there, because there are. But I can, you know, I always see, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I did not for this one, but I drive a mm-hmm. lot and I do listen to them a lot. So, okay, so how many times a week do you do I Should Be Writing? Not often enough. I used to try to do it weekly and now I don't really get to it that often. I try to do bi-weekly, but um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, depending on what your writing schedule probably too. Yeah. You know. Okay, so then the other one, Ditch Diggers, you um, explain that one. That's a different That's a different concept, right? Ditch Diggers is another writing podcast, but it is for professional writers because there were – nobody was talking about uh, 
like when 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 you get started and you actually sell a book, then suddenly all you're 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 suddenly new again. It's just all the problems are new. Like all the problems of how do I write a book, how do I publish a book, that's all behind you. But new books of how to deal with an agent, how to deal with an editor, how to handle your contracts, what happens if your agent quits, what happens if your editor quits, what happens if your publishing house shuts shuts its doors and runs off. I mean, wow. so we decided, uh, my friend Matt Wallace and I decided that we were going to do a show that was um, – more business focused and I should be writing as very much come on little writer you can do it and it doesn't you know I want to tell anybody who wants to try writing do it Mm -hmm. ditch diggers is all right we're we're beyond the encouragement and now we have to talk about the realities of what happens when it actually starts and it's not always good news, but we, we talk about stuff that a lot of other people won't talk about Mm -hmm. Um, or stuff that you only hear about, like at a bar at conventions, not written about online. Right. And uh, so we talk, just talk about all sorts of business things. People write in with business questions. Um, I'm trying to think of stuff. We, we actually, and we don't talk about, and the reason why we call it ditch diggers Mm -hmm. is because um, if you want to be a working writer, you have to do the work. You can't wait for inspiration. You can't hold your craft as a precious stone to your chest. That's great. And art is a beautiful thing, but we've got to (laughs) eat. And so the, the concept is ditch diggers don't get ditch digger block. They just go to work and they do their work. So you have to, if you want to be a working writer, again, I'm not saying art is bad. I'm just saying if you want to be a working writer and work and make money doing it, you have to go to work. You have to dig the ditches. You have to do the work. You may have to write ad copy. You may have to write website stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, articles. You, articles. You may have to write scripts for training videos. You know, you may not get the dream uh, novel deal you always wanted. So where else can you find work if you want to be a working writer. And so that's what Ditch Diggers is about. Mm -hmm. It's um, much more business focused. And uh, we talk about some stuff that that may not always be good. It may not always be good for beginners to hear. I'm very grateful when my beginner, um, my I should be writing fans listen to Ditch Diggers because more more listeners is great. But I worry sometimes they get dejected when they start hearing about the problems that they'll have, that they may have once the book actually sells. What do you, what advice do you give to new authors that um, decide to self publish through Amazon? What's, what's specifically the question? Like if they're saying, do you think I should, you know, like here I am, I'm a writer. Um, do you suggest that I self publish and then that way I can keep writing or should I really try to focus on getting an agent and getting it published through you know, a book publisher or, or should I just put my stuff up on Amazon and just keep going and, and wait and hope that a book publisher comes to me instead of me actively searching out a book publisher or an agent? Well, there are two, uh, there are two viable ways of publishing and neither is bad and neither is perfect. And there are good reasons to go with either way. Um, I usually have the people ask themselves, you need to assess the quality of your book and you need to be completely honest because as much as we hate the fact that there are gatekeepers, the gatekeepers are there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And yes, they have rejected a number of books that went on to be incredible self-publishing bestsellers, but I can promise you they rejected a lot more stuff that went on to become self-publishing duds too. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people think that they can skip over Mm -hmm. rejection by publishing on Amazon and then they will get the lovely rejection of no sales or they'll get sales and wonderful, honest Amazon reviews, which is, (laughs) which is a rejection for everyone else in the world to see. Right. So it's, it's, you're not avoiding rejection if you're self publishing. Um, interesting. No, that I, I ask that question a lot to people, but that, that is a very good answer. Like I never thought about that before. Right. You got to, you got to think, um, 
you know, Amazon makes it easy. And, and so that's nice. And, and I'm happy that there are some people out that can get their stuff out. I've read some mm -hmm. good stuff, but I do, I've also talked to book publishers and I do still believe that there is something that they have to offer that, oh, yeah. you know, I, and there are and, enough of them now, don't you think? Like before there weren't that many. And now it seems like there's a lot of book publishers out there. You know, I think that the industry has opened up a lot, but you know, they, and they want the best for the people that they have. I mean, you know, they, they do that. That's why they're there. And, um, you know, I, I, like I said, yeah, I think you're, I, you know, I talked to both ways. So I just wondered what you are. So some people I talked to, it's like, no, indie all the way. I'm doing it myself. I'm doing it. I'm going to be my editor. I'm going to be my, you know, I'm going to send it to my mom. I'm going to send it to my sister and, <laughs> and I'm going to have them edit it, you know, and then, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're going to be nice to me and <laughs> good luck. Right. Uh, exactly. For me, I, I know I can't edit my own stuff. No author can. Um, and there's, uh, there's the issue of cover design. I think I'm one of the few people in the world that is completely honest with myself at the fact that I suck at graphic design. I do not think visually at all. Mm -hmm. Um, the only skills I have regarding um, graphic design is I could pretty much always spot a self-published book cover. Yes. And actually, I, I um, the couple of things I have self-published, I've had other people design the covers, except for one thing, which looks like a self-published book cover. But uh, those series that I self-published and had someone else design the covers, I finally, I saw a, a cover that... I thought was a nice illustration. It's not like it was bad art, right. but I sent it to him and I said, look, I know this is self-published because it, it just screams. They don't know what they're doing, but I don't know what it is about this that is wrong. So can you tell me what, why I think this is self-publishing? And he wrote back this long list of stuff about the font of the title, whether it had a drop yeah. shadow, uh, how the eye goes from top left to bottom right. And so you don't want a whole bunch of, you don't want anything to draw your eye like bottom left and just weird a whole bunch of information. It's like, I don't know anything about that. So I, I know that if I want to self-publish something, it's not just a matter of writing something and putting it online. I'm going to want to hire an editor and I'm going to want to hire a cover designer for sure, because I don't know what I'm doing. And so then it becomes less of me being a writer, publishing my own stuff and more me being a project manager, handling a lot of little pieces. And, um, that just makes me tired. Yeah. I'm glad I did self publish some things. I had a, uh, a novella series that I released via podcast that was a hands down favorite um, for all of my listeners. Everybody loved it. And I had agents interested in it, but no one could ever sell it. Mm -hmm. And I did a Kickstarter campaign to fund the uh, production of the ebook because, again, I wanted to spend money on it and make it an actual good product. And that one was hugely successful. And then another agent got in touch with me and said they wanted to sell the book. And I'm like, go for it. It's not going to sell. And it never did. Hmm. And this book still makes me money every month. And so that, that is a case where I was pretty confident that the self-publishing would go okay. And it was worth all the extra work I did. But, um, you know, there's some things where I've wondered that if I couldn't sell something, I'm like, should I self-publish this? Maybe there's a reason I can't sell it. It's, uh, there are lots of reasons they don't buy books. Some of them are, they don't know how to sell them. Some of them are, they just bought a book like that. And in that, in those cases, it's like, well, might as well self publish if it's good. Right. Um, but if the you know, but the reason also may be it's not good enough and, uh, you need to really come to terms with that and realize that all, what you need to do is keep writing and move on and get better. Right. And I have to tell you that. I will read a book. I never look, okay, to see if it's published. I, I never look. And I, so I will read it. And I, nine times out of ten, I am right, okay? When I finish the book, I'm like, oh, it's, pu it's published. And I look mm -hmm. and I'm like, very rarely does a self-published book come, 
come past me that I say, oh, this is published, and then it's self-published. And you're right, mm -hmm. I don't know the reasons why either, but I did have a publisher give me the same reasons when I was interviewing them. I was like, why do I know? Because I can't figure out why, I, you know, it's a half-decent cover. It's a, you know, like I'll say, it, but the type looked okay, and it was half decent and the margins looked, but then he's like, nope, they still don't know that it's this and this, and, this. and I was like, Wow, I don't even know that. I'm reading the book and I don't even know that. So, yeah. you know, there are things that they know about how to make it pleasing to the eye. But I am rarely wrong. So there's something about it. Mm -hmm. You know, on my Kindle, not so much, probably. I, I probably can't tell so much. But sure, yeah, that's tougher. tougher. That's tougher. But if I have it in, you know, and I am happy it's out there. It's not like I'm not because I have, I've talked to some great indie authors and, oh, and sure. you know, I'm happy that it's out there. But, um, yeah, you do have to, and I don't read Amazon reviews either. Cause I don't want to be, I don't want to be biased. And a lot of the, <laughs> like you said, I don't want to yeah. go into it. If I want to read it, I'm going to read it. So I don't yeah. want to hear what they have to say. And I rarely re, you know, if I really, really like one and I want to help the author out, then I do. But I hate that it's, I hate that the authors have to think about it. That's the part I hate. That think about what? Think about Amazon reviews. Yeah, I try not to. Yeah. I that way lies madness. I have the kind of self-esteem that if someone says, I loved A, B, C, and D about this book, it was so good. I just wish that E was a little bit stronger. I will obsess. What did I do wrong about that E part? What did I do wrong? Oh, my God, they hated it. I, I will do that. Yeah, I, it's like, I and so I don't read all any the reviews. characters except for this one or so, you know, and then I don't know. I just think yep. they're really critical and I try not, I don't want to be, I don't want to, I just don't want to pre-read anything like that. So I don't read them. And I'm finding more and more people are not reading them because they're getting, some of them are paid. Some of them are, you don't even know anymore mm -hmm. anyway, you know, so I don't take it as unbiased review anyway. Yeah. I had a friend who apparently got a one star book review because someone had ordered sausage and <laughs> had gotten his book instead. And so he, the, the person was so angry. They, instead of blaming, you know, Amazon or whatever, they blamed the author and gave his book a one star review. And the weirdest thing was, is that two people found that review helpful. <laughs> that That's, that's what I heard. I just, you know, what's I, funny I couldn't believe that. I have an order from Amazon. Like, I, you can only imagine, like, every day I'm getting boxes from Amazon, right? And I open them as I need them. I kind of stick them over in a corner. Well, I opened up this one box, and it was a, a bottle of vitamins, B complex. So I'm, I have six children. I'm like, okay, did any of you order B complex? <laughs> They're like, no. And I'm like, I guess Amazon did, but it's been so long since they, you know, I don't even know what to do with them. So I still have mm -hmm. them, but Amazon does make mistakes. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> okay. So what are you doing now? So, you know, we know, um, this just came for everybody that, you know, that hasn't read it yet and that I want them to read it. This just came out, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It just came out. This just came out. Um, was there a hardback? No. Okay. No, just trade paperback. Trade paperback. Released yeah. uh, January 31st. I so. will buy hardback. If I, That's why I know that this probably didn't have one because I will buy the hardback before I buy mm -hmm. it. I'm just one of those weird people that like to pay more money for hardbacks. <laughs> and we love people like you. <laughs> Um, I am actually working on a couple of book proposals right now. I don't have anything I'm, uh, currently writing. So I'm, I'm in a very early period of creativity right now, trying to get some proposals up for my, uh, agent to sell. I'm working on some short stories and some, um, I'm still working on the serial book burners, which is a, project I've been working on for three years with a group of people where we treat it like HBO for eBooks, where we get together and have like a writer's room where we talk about the arc of, we use TV language the whole way through. We call it the season. We call each one an episode, but really it's just a 10, 12,000 word story, but each one is self-contained, but leads toward a, an end result like a TV season. So, um, We've got, we're working on season three of Book Burners right now, and uh, we'll be thinking about season four soon. So those are the little things I'm working on. Is that where while you I'm find that? Is that on YouTube? No, no, it's just, it's a, it's ebook and audiobook, and the first yeah. season came out um, 
the same day as Six Weeks, actually. It was weird having two books out in one day. Oh, that's but very the first cool. Yeah, the first season came out, we uh somebody brought the bought the print right, so we sold the actual book uh this year. Uh it's called Book Burners. It's like a if you like the librarians or Warehouse Thirteen kind of a group of people whose job it is to go out and find weird stuff, uh, demonic books or wizards doing not naughty things and shut them down before they wreak havoc. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the concept of it. Oh, that's it's a lot like the librarians, but darker. Yeah. And that's the, very cool. I did read, and now that you're saying it, I'm like, Oh, I do remember reading about that. That's mm-hmm. very awesome. So when you, like you said, you have a, a child, like, do you, when do you write? Like, if you are in the midst of a book, like, do you have a time frame? Is, is do you have, is like, he's at school, he or she, I don't know, do you, what do you have, a daughter? Oh, a 14 14-year-old daughter. 14-year-old. So, yeah, she doesn't need a lot of, uh, yeah, she doesn't need a lot of supervision. The woman, yeah. I talked to an author this morning, I kid you not, four children under four, set of twins that are one. And that woman is writing books at, in the middle of the night. Wow. <laughs> so as a mom, we were both going, ah, oh, that's so, that's not, I was like, wow, bless you child. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I work from home. I podcast and, and write full time. So yes. I do it when she's out of school. And then, you know, if I have something else to do, like I said, she's, she's always been pretty independent. I've been very lucky with that. I didn't realize until I had a play date with another mother whose child was basically around their leg the whole time. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, I didn't know my kid was, was different. Okay. So she's off in the corner with a book or something or, but uh, very lucky to have a pretty independent kid. So she's always been kind of doing her own thing. So Well, that's uh, awesome. I mean, you know, as I, I did not, I was not a working mom. I, well, I was for a little bit, but I had six. So after my fourth one, I decided to stay home and be a mom. But, you know, I love that the ins- inspiration that you guys give to other moms out there. Because writing is something they can do. They, oh, it yeah. It is possible. You know, that is a profession that's definitely possible with st- being able to, quote unquote, stay at home and be a mom. So mm-hmm. I love hearing those stories. But Oh, anyway, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. It's been so much fun, Mer. You're sure. Great. It's been a lot talking to you. Thank uh, you. No, it's been so much fun. So anybody wants to read Six Wakes, there it is. And I will put the links up on this and all your links. And um, they can get it at the Amazon. It'll be delivered in two days. I love that yeah. about Amazon. <laughs> One day if you pay a little bit more. But, That's right. Um, <laughs> so I can't wait to hear about your next project. I mean, you know where to find me, and I'd love to hear about it whenever you want to chat. Thank you. I'd love to. Okay. Well, you have a great day. Thank you so much. You too. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. Yeah.